of the Office of Policy and Management can make an announcement saying the state of Connecticut will be saving $12 billion over the next 25 years, as they did last week. As the department charged with providing crucial information and analysis on the state of the state, they help the governor's office in formulating public policy goals for Connecticut and guide towns and cities on implementing policy decisions that will benefit the residents of our state. Under Secretary Martin Heff joins the Municipal Voice today to discuss this and more. We'd like to thank our sponsors at Gateway and Housatana Community Colleges. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or our member municipal leaders. Martin, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate you being here. Um, so you have been on before, uh, but it's been almost two years now. So just for our listeners at home, could you give us a little refresher on what OPM does and what your role is there? Sure, great, and it's, and it's great to be back on with you. Uh, overall, OPM functions as the governor's staff agency and plays a central role you know, in state government, providing information, analysis to formulate public policy for the state, all of our state agencies and municipalities in implementing those policies. The Intergovernmental Policy and Planning Division, which I head up, mm -hmm. handles the relationship between the state our regional council of governments and our municipalities. Yeah. Um, so as you just said, uh, the relationship with municipalities does fall kind of under your purview there. So how does OPM operate and cooperate with uh, Connecticut's municipalities? Sure, so we have two units in the intergovernmental uh, division. One, the Office of Responsible Growth, and the second is the Assessment Data Collection and Grants Management. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of the conduit, you know, as you've mentioned, for intergovernmental communications between the COGS, between the municipalities, between uh, anything that goes on with the state between those. So mm -hmm. we, you know, between gathering information, disseminating, disseminating information, you know, anything of needs of the municipalities, the programs that we are available to them, whether it be municipal grants or there are municipal uh, plans of conservation development, affordable mm -hmm. housing any sort of leg legislative activities that are affecting them, you know, we're gonna be that conduit for them. Well, that sounds really good. Um, obviously you cover a lot of stuff there, but is there kind of one thing that you wish municipalities knew they could come to OPM for? So, yeah, no, we don't want them contacting us at all. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Lose our um, number. You know, I think uh, more so, I don't think most municipalities realize we have the two different units. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them know that we handle the municipal grant side of it. So they obviously yeah. working at their municipal grants. Um, so, but they're not aware of the Office of Responsible Growth that does head up, you know, the State Plan of Conservation Development, mm -hmm. the um, Connecticut Environmental Protection Act uh, portions of that. I mean, so overall, I mean, we have a great working relationship with the municipalities. And due to me coming from a municipal background, I often mm -hmm. get you know, numerous inquiries you know, that necessarily aren't in our wheelhouse. I get them from yeah. internal, you know, oh, it's municipal, send them to Martin. You know, and we're always more than happy to you know, help direct you mm -hmm. know, those municipalities to wherever they're, and they, you know, we need to direct them to. Yeah. So I don't think there's necessarily, you know, one particular issue that municipalities need to know mm -hmm. it's like OPM is doing because they know if it's something municipal, they can reach out to us and we'll help find who that right yeah. person is to get them. E even if it's not you, you'll know the person that they should Correct. be talking to. Yeah. Right. Um, so recently, uh, OPM had tweeted about its final budget forecast for uh, the year 2022. And OPM is estimating that the state will save billions of dollars over the next two decades. Um, we assume this is a good thing. Uh, can you tell us about the implications for towns and cities with, you know, coffers full, so you having some savings and kind of other circumstances? Is there a chance that uh, municipalities might see programs like uh, payment in lieu of taxes fully funded? Sure. So as we know, we're getting ready for the next biennium budget, which will be for fiscal 24 and 25. Mm -hmm. Governor will present, you know, his budget in February. And as we know, budget involves, you know, estimates, back and forth negotiations, ultimately a vote by the legislature. I think a lot's mm -hmm. going to happen in this next budget cycle, being a biennium budget. They just mm -hmm. adopted the midterm budget with some adjustments. Yep. Um, municipalities are going to be fighting for, you know, more state aid. 
as well as state agencies, other organizations, mm -hmm. especially as you mentioned with coffers being a little bit higher right now yep. um, on that. Um, so to say, you know, is it going to be fully funded, anything, you know, pilot hasn't been fully funded in a number of years. But the yeah. good thing is, is that since fiscal year 2020, mm -hmm. state aid to municipalities has grown over 300 million. Mm -hmm. And that's going to continue to grow because now a lot of the distributions are set with the municipal revenue sharing account, mm -hmm. you know, which is tax portion of the tax proceeds as those are starting to be phased in, especially under pilot through the motor vehicle tax grant, municipalities are going to see more funding coming their way in those. Yeah. Um, so uh, in 2021, a tiered plan was approved by the legislature. Where would you say this plan falls in happening between, you know, a realistic and optimistic sort of outlook? Yeah, so, yeah, so the tiered pilot, for those that don't know, established three tiers mm -hmm. of municipalities based upon their equalized net grant list per capita. Mm -hmm. um, the formula calculation, you know, in the past was always based upon actual tax revenue loss. It was a reimbursement mm -hmm. that way. Now it kind of, this moves the grants more towards a need basis based okay. upon that net gram list having the three tiers. So we're only a year into that formula. So we mm -hmm. haven't really analyzed the full impacts of that and everything. Definitely, yeah. you know, the towns are receiving more money, as I mentioned, you know, about 150 million more in pilot this past year because of the new formula and mm -hmm. with the municipal revenue sharing, you know, account. So that's yeah. always a plus and everything. So we still have to analyze, you know, is this the best new approach to this, you know, mm -hmm. process or not, but only being one year into it, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, is the this jury's, the right path? jury's still out, but. Right. So but municipalities are seeing a benefit from it, from this increase in funding that they also mm -hmm. attach to it. So early, early reports are promising, but will we'll remain to be seen in the long run. Right. Well, that, that's always, always good. I'm going to be optimistic. Um, so one thing that is definitely going to affect uh, towns and cities in Connecticut is the reevaluation maps that were recently changed to uh, cohere with the uh, councils of governments. Uh, can you explain what OPM's role in this is and why reevaluations are important to Connecticut's municipalities? Sure. So state statutes actually set revaluation in the state of Connecticut uh, provides that the secretary establish a revaluation schedule. So the revaluation program is basically undertaken to secure a more equitable distribution of the tax burden, bring mm -hmm. assessment levels all up to date equal across the board every five years, and okay. to modernize any assessment procedures used on the local level. So the new legislation which we've been working on with a committee which is made mm -hmm. up of uh, municipal officials, our assessors, um, we've had tax collectors involved, we've had our, our COGS involved okay. with this. Um, and basically, we are aligning revaluations with the planning regions, which are governed by the Council of Governments. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, legislation actually, you know, is by planning region, which are the boundaries mm -hmm. of our Council of Governments. And we've made five revaluation zones, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, and that's obviously to coincide with the five-year schedule. Yeah. So currently, you know, our schedule, we may have one year where there's 70 towns that mm -hmm. are revaluing, and the next year there may only be 10. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we're trying to balance that out um, and coordinate the revaluation cycles by each by the municipalities within each zone, mm -hmm. basically trying to redistribute the number of revaluations performed annually statewide. Okay. Now, most people think, oh, that the whole zone is going to be revalued at the same time. That's not the case. 20% okay. of each zone is going to get revalued each of the five years. So over the five-year okay. period, 20% each year of those zones. Um, and part of that is we work with vendors, we work with the municipalities and everything else. It was impossible to try to do the entire zone mm -hmm. at once just because you don't have, you know, the people power to be able yeah. to do that. We don't have the, you know, all of that there. So doing it by the 20% by each zone, it still will, you know, provide the benefits that are, that we're looking at. Yeah. So it just sounds like it's a more efficient schedule and that, you know, you hit 20% a year and over five years, that means you hit 100%. Correct. Well, that makes perfect sense. It sounds like something probably should have been done a, a while ago. Um, is there uh, any role OPM plays in motor vehicle assessment? 
So yes, uh, that's it's actually a large role that OPM plays okay. in you know motor vehicle assessment as well as assessment taxation overall. Okay. Um, by statute, another you know most of our stuff is by statute with assessment mm -hmm. taxation. Um, each grand list year, the secretary has to send out to every town how we are going to price motor vehicles. Okay. Historically, you know, we always work with the Connecticut Association of Assessing Officers, that's in statute, that we work with them mm -hmm. in developing what we're going to use. Currently, we use um, uh, NADA as their book and their values on that okay. based upon, you know, their, the current values. But with the new legislation that was passed in the budget package, Effective with the grand list 2023, so October 1st of 23, mm -hmm. which will be our tax bills for 20, fiscal year 24, mm -hmm. we're going to be changing the process to a manufactured suggested retail price value okay. with a 20-year depreciation schedule. Okay. So for a taxpayer, they're going to know exactly what their tax bill is going to be every year because they're okay. going to know that here's my manufactured suggested retail price. I'm at year 10, I can look on the depreciation schedule, this is how much reduction there is, that's mm -hmm. what my assessment's gonna be, times my mill rate, I know what my taxes are. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, as we've seen this past year, motor vehicle values have skyrocketed. Yeah. Anywhere, you know, 30, 40% because, obviously because of the pandemic, we've seen the same with mm -hmm. housing. This is going to eliminate that um, because you're gonna have a set value and then it's depreciated over 20 years mm -hmm. at that 20 year mark it's, it's a 500 dollars minimum value same yeah, as yeah. an antique value plate if you were at 20 years you could get mm -hmm. an antique value at 500 dollars. that's going to be your tax bill after mm -hmm. 20 years that seems to make a lot of sense so if someone had you know five years under the old system if they bought a car five years ago you know something they could afford the taxes on whatever and all of a sudden now because of the market that car is actually worth more than what they paid for it suddenly their taxes would be worth Correct. But, but the new system would say, your car is getting older, it's slowly going to decrease at, at this predictable set pace that you can plan for, for your budgeting. Correct. For, right. And that's kind of the same yeah. method that's used with a lot of personal property. Mm -hmm. uh, declarations that get filled out by our businesses, it, they're all on a depreciation schedule. So it's actually following that same methodology. Okay, so it seems like that makes a whole lot of sense. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. So uh, the COGS, back to the COGS a little bit, are interesting because OPM does handle some of the census data uh, and your department was the one who approached the Census Bureau on their behalf. Um, OPM Secretary Jeffrey Beckham said that there will be no significant impact on how state or local governments are run but it will have some impact. Do you think uh, at some point it will? Um, it seems like it might just be starting place for greater cooperation in the future, ultimately leading to change in the way we perceive kind of local governments and the COD's role in that. Yeah, so yes, uh, OPM, you know, we worked with the COGS mm -hmm. and uh, internally here, not only with the Office of Responsible Growth that works with all of our COGS as one of our units, but our data and policy analytics unit Mm -hmm. here at OPM, which is ultimately responsible for the GIS and the data collection pieces mm -hmm. uh, to establish the planning regions as the statistical equivalent of counties. Mm -hmm. You know, the rationale of this change as we, you know, as we've put out there from day one is not a return to county government. Mm -hmm. It's not to affect home rule or local control. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's aligning the data of the planning regions rather than the defunct counties that we yep. don't use anymore since the 60s, since, yeah. you know, even though we're, there are still boundaries that we have. Um, but overall, it's going to improve our abilities in planning and decision making, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the planning regions of how we're operating, you know, in municipal government, how we're looking mm -hmm. at things by the state and everything, it's going to help more in our planning and decision making. So we see those as mm -hmm those changes and the impacts that it's going to be coming down, down the road, not necessarily yeah. the way that we, you know, run government. Yeah. And also the, the county equivalency for the COGS allows some access to uh, federal monies like ARP and stuff like that, right? So, so yeah, we're not, you know, we haven't, the states, let's put it, the state is not losing any federal dollars mm -hmm. by not having the county equivalency. Mm -hmm. um, this provides another opportunity or another 
source to be able to apply for funding. Mm -hmm. So where in the past, where if it was a county equivalent or county funds coming in, the state would receive those and distribute them, mm -hmm. you know, accordingly. Um, so that is something we will work with, you know, our council of governments with that if there's certain funding mm -hmm. out there, who's better to administer it? Is it, on the, is it on the planning region level or is it on mm -hmm. the state level, depending what it is? Um, but at this point, you know, we haven't seen that, we've, that we're losing any money in that mm -hmm. sense, but it does provide some more opportunities for us. And, and could uh, some of these changes possibly change the way OPM interacts uh, with municipalities in the future? So I think so, as we've talked about, you know, the planning and decision-making processes, mm -hmm. you know, we're consistently looking at, you know, shared services, regionalization, you yeah. have better efficiencies, you know, potential cost savings, and being able to analyze more accurately with this data at this level, it's gonna be a benefit to both the state and to the municipalities overall. So I think that will be, you know, small changes the way we're interacting by the data that we're gonna be able to receive and analyze. We've talked a lot about taxes and revaluations re and kind of money stuff that makes a lot of sense, uh, seems like a natural fit for OPM. But uh, you also recently were, were talking about in an article about the drought. Um, you had announced that there's steps that should be taken to reduce water usage in Connecticut. Uh, so first of all, what is OPM's role in the area of water usage? So OPM has a seat on the Connecticut Water Planning Council, which is established by state statute. Okay. And then also as my seat as representative on the Water Planning Council, I chair the interagency drought work group. Okay. Both of these were created under the state water plan um, and the drought plan that have been mm -hmm. adopted. For everyone out there that doesn't pay as close attention, how, how, what kind of drought are we in? Like how bad is it in Connecticut? So currently, um, the, the drought plan, we have five stages. Okay. Um, stage three is actually when we declare a drought mm -hmm. um, in the state that we actually have a drought in the state. Currently, the entire state is at a stage two. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of more of a public awareness state. Okay, so we're not we're a full-on drought yet. To, yeah, we're getting close to that next level. So we want to make you aware. We get information out, mm -hmm. ways to conserve water things mm -hmm. that you should be aware of. So when we go to stage three, you know, you're aware of these things and it's more of a heightened awareness. Mm -hmm. Stage four is when we start getting into certain, you know, mandatory restrictions and everything else as we start getting into worse scenarios. Okay. So like when we see like pictures from out West where like Lake Mead is drying up, that's like stage, that would be like stage four or five for us. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Those are in, you know, dire, <laughs> dire drought situations. Yes. Okay. And we're not, we're not anywhere near there yet in Connecticut. We're not at those stages yet. You know, unfortunately, you know, weather forecasts, as we know, we haven't mm -hmm. been receiving precipitation. Yeah. Uh, the warmer temperatures that we're having, those are not all good mixes for helping, you know, get us out of drought. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, conditions are worsening. So we're, you know, keep progressing there. We actually have a meeting later this week, um, you know, on the drought and making yeah. any recommendations to the governor, you know, once we go through mm -hmm. all of the data. Yeah, I certainly know I haven't had to uh, mow my brownish lawn <laughs> as, as much recently. So what would um, the impact on the towns be of some of these water restrictions if, if we had to put them in? And also some of the, the stuff you're talking about to get us ready. So municipalities, you know, whether they're served by a public water system, whether they're on private wells, mm -hmm. you know, I think the biggest thing is to be aware of the conditions and be aware of their responsibilities. Each mm -hmm. municipality has a what we call a municipal drought liaison that is set up through their uh, Department of Emergency Management, Homeland Security. Okay. Some of those are their emergency management directors. Some are a volunteer that's, you know, dealing with the drought. Um, and they report back through their Demis region. So okay. we are in constant communication with them, letting them know any actions that the town should be taking. But mm -hmm. also the reverse is we want to know what's happening in their towns. Okay. Uh, two years ago, we had private wells drying up down in lower eastern, you know, Connecticut, okay. Allentown area, you know, mm -hmm. as an example. So getting that information back to us, you know, was helpful so we can start ascertaining, you know, what are the conditions, what's happening here mm -hmm. on that. So, you know, it's a two-way street. We need to make sure that the communication's flowing back and forth and those uh, municipal municipalities through the liaisons, mm -hmm. through their uh, Demis regions, you know, become that conduit back to us and us to them. Yeah. Um, and then municipalities may also want to look at 
adopting local water conservation ordinances. We do have a number of municipalities that have them already, so that when we do get to these stages, they have some authority to mm -hmm. actually put local restrictions on, similar to that that the water suppliers have mm -hmm. already. Uh, some of our restrictions can't really happen until like stage four of the drought, okay. unless the governor calls for like emergency declarations and everything prior to that. Mm -hmm. But the municipal ones could go into, in effect, before yours could. Correct. The municipality would have their own local authority that they, depending upon the local conditions, mm -hmm. could, you know, be at a higher stage than what the state is at. Correct. Yeah. So their, their town in particular might actually be in a drier area or their aquifers, whatever, where the rest of the state might not be. That's, that's right. And we, and we yeah. do see that, you know, where it's, yeah. you know, it's hard because we do look at things by, you know, the county level, you mm -hmm. know, as we're looking at things. But we know that there's little pockets here and there that are yeah. worse than others. You know, yeah. on that. So that's why the, the water doesn't pay attention to, to, to counties or town lines right. or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Once again, like the last time we had you on the show, we're, you know, just beginning to understand the pandemic. And when we had you on last, we asked the, you know, what the immediate future looked like for OPM. So now looking back on, you know, two years on it, how have the last few years operated for OPM? Was it difficult to maintain certain projects uh, for a while during all this? And have you gotten back to some of them? Sure. So, you know, as you said, so much has happened. It's hard to believe it's been two years yeah. um, of the pandemic, <clears throat> you know, and I definitely feel, you know, teleworking has definitely changed the way we conduct business, mm -hmm. you know, on, you know, a municipal level with municipalities having to do things, excuse me, remotely, having yeah. remote meetings, um, collecting taxes more, maybe online, mm -hmm. um, office of policy management, you know, we've, went through and processed over the past couple of years, millions of dollars with the CARES Act funding mm -hmm. and the American Rescue Plan Act. We're in the process now of getting the second tranche of that out toward the municipalities. Okay. So, you know, in one sense, I mean, we've just been going strong throughout this whole thing because mm -hmm. we've had kind of our role got shifted where we're dealing with getting funding out and overseeing yeah. some of the pandemic money that came down from federal government yeah. on top of as well as getting all of our normal you know, work that needed to be done. Yeah. The one thing that was kind of, if you will, uh, saving grace during that period was on the legislative side, you know, they really weren't in session. That first year, mm. you know, they did one bill you yeah. know, on it. So there was very little. And the second year was you know, even smaller. We're back you know, this past year more into a full you know, general assembly. So we weren't as much dealing with the legislative pieces, mm -hmm. which was good because we had this other work that we needed to have yeah. done so uh, but overall we were able to reprioritize extend some of the deadlines you know through executive mm -hmm. orders to help municipalities to help the state and everything else but we kept things on track and kept things progressing so we didn't you know in essence miss deadlines no work mm -hmm. was pushed off we kept everything up to date we're currently on track you know mm -hmm. here at OPM with the things we're doing starting to work on you know some of the newer things um, mm -hmm. And so we're in good shape. Uh, speaking of newer things, um, what do you see in the forecast for OPM over the next couple of months, years? Are there, you know, some new plans that you're excited, um, you know, a, a change to the way you're doing business? So over the next, we'll start off over the next several months, mm -hmm. uh, municipalities are going to see a number of municipal grants coming out mm -hmm. that are going to be awarded. That application processes are out now. Okay. Um, you know, which is exciting for them. And I know they're all working, you know, to get applications in by the mm -hmm. deadlines, but you've got 30 million in steep coming up, the small town economic okay. assistance program. We've got 12 million in transit oriented development program. Uh, our COGS have the regional performance incentive program, mm -hmm. which municipalities shared services, looking at those, we're mm -hmm. looking at, you know, getting funds of that out. We're mm -hmm. also going to be announcing early fall the Intertown Capital Equipment Sharing Program, which hasn't okay. been done since 2015. Um, so that's kind of near term. As yeah, we and there's still time to apply for towns to apply to, to a lot of these? Yes. Yep. The deadline like for steep, the first uh, steep is August 15th. The mm -hmm. uh, TOD grant is September 1st. So, so all that kind of stuff would be on Capital like the OPM website or something? Until the fall, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, more longer term as you're going to see more of the reporting that has to happen to mm -hmm. OPM, at least in my division, okay. is going to be online. 
Okay. Um, it's not going to be paid. We're eliminating paper. We've already put a couple mm -hmm. different modules up so people can do their reporting online. We talked mm -hmm. about revaluation. Some of the certifications that have to come to OPM are going to be online now. It's not going to okay. be submitting paper forms either by email or whatever else. You're going to upload it into the mm -hmm. portal system. We had just switched over our distressed municipalities program into the portal system. We did all of the COVID mm -hmm. over our portal system online, eliminating yeah. all that. So we're trying to work on streamlining mm -hmm. uh, those type of processes for everybody. Um, you know, and I think as we move into the next, you know, post-election in this legislative session, mm -hmm. you're going to see a greater focus on shared services, regionalization. And we know it's talked about all the time, but I honestly believe there's going to be a much stronger, mm -hmm. you know, incentive and, yeah. you know, push for this to happen. Obviously, you know, one of the things, you know, with my background and being here at OPM, you mm -hmm. know, we want to work with the municipalities, you know, on these approaches to streamline those services, create efficiencies, help mm -hmm. reduce that tax burden. You know, overall, yeah. those are, you know, main goals that we're seeing going forward here over this next year. Excellent. Um, well, Martin, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, Keep doing the work. Well, it's great. No, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, anytime that we can uh, be of help with, you know, CCM and our uh, member municipalities, we're more than happy to do so. We'd like to thank our guest, Martin Heft. I'd like to thank our sponsors at Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Moyle is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry draws is on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page. CCM's annual convention returns Tuesday, November 1st at the Mohegan Sun Convention Center. This year's convention will be capped off by Connecticut's final 2022 gubernatorial debate. Learn more at ccm-ct.org.